I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. I'm delighted to welcome today's guest, a former retired Colonel, U.S. Army, Robert Cassidy. He is the Anderson Fellow in Defense and Foreign Affairs at Wesleyan University. Colonel Cassidy, thank you so much for your time today. Hi, Alexander. Thank you for having me on your show. Let me ask you, just to begin with, to give an assessment of foreign policy, looking at the first year of the Biden administration. Um, you know, I know that you have studied global conflict and in particular U.S. involvement in, in foreign relations and our various entanglements and conflicts in which we've been immersed in the last half century. What's your sense of the first year of the Biden presidency? My sense of the first year of the Biden presidency in terms of foreign and security policy is uh, I'm not I'm not that that keen on what they've done so far, but know this I'm very glad that this administration is in the White House vis-a-vis uh, -vis the previous one, but I think that um, well the one thing they did early on was to recognize the the genocide in Armenia. I thought that was a positive thing. They spent some intellect, some uh, political capital on that. But then um, I think between April and, and August, the, uh, the decisions that the, the senior administration national security practitioners made were not uh, thought through. I think they, they could have thought through how they were going to uh, collapse out of Afghanistan. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but even as the thing was unfolding, uh, as they came in, I was, I was, I felt that the, the president had already decided that he was done with the war in Afghanistan back when he was a senator and became vice president in, in 2009. So I am, um, I am a veteran of the U.S. Army, so th these comments are my own. They're not associated with the Army or the U.S. government. I, I am glad that the Biden pres presidency is in, but I think that their, uh, their national security team is not strong enough. I think they need to be more, uh, analytical, more deliberate, and more strategically uh, oriented. A longer view to what this country should and can do. You reference Afghanistan um, and the decision basically that President Biden was going to, to ultimately deliver on a withdrawal one way or another. What was primarily criticized w was the absent-mindedness of it, or, or at least the, the idea that uh, we did not anticipate um, that the civilian government uh, would break down. Um, but is it, is it that um, clear to you, or, or is it rather the case that President Biden and his administration just didn't want to tell the American public that, of course, the Taliban was going to uh, retain power and, and uh, revive uh, its, its, you know, government. To be honest, it was not crystal clear to me uh, when the Biden administration decided that it was going to follow through on the commitment to withdraw that the previous administration had made. But um, it was clear to me that the, uh, the peace agreement that Zalman Khalilzad and his assistance from the previous administration that the agreement they penned was, was utterly incongruous. It was not enforceable. It was not uh, favorable to our side. It was not gonna support a, an independent uh, Afghanistan under the previous administration. I think it was disingenuous on that administration to sign that agreement. And I think it was um, immaturish of the subsequent administration to go with the agreement as is because there was no way we could enforce what we needed to have in Afghanistan for it to remain stable. And the people in Afghanistan, they've been at war for over 40 years. If you, if you want to include the Soviet Afghan war, they've been under uh, pressure daily from uh, combatants on all sides and they're rational actors. And so they, they, they're not cowards. They just decided as, as, as they saw the writing on the wall and the agreement was penned and we said we're gonna go through with it. They, may, they probably waited to see what the new administration was gonna do, but then they, they acted on their intuition, which was do they wanna live or they wanna die? And at the same time, uh, the, the last time the Taliban came through from 94 to 96 to take over almost all of Afghanistan, it was a similar 
um, transaction where they would, do you want to fight or do you, do you want to die? Because we're going to fight to come in or we'll come in peacefully and we'll give you some, uh, we're not going to arrest and, and kill everybody. And so um, there, I think the Afghans that served with and the Afghans who were just living through the war had to make some decisions on life and death and they went with, uh, let's stop the war and face the consequences. We didn't put the diligence into what the implications of withdrawing in total would be. And just from your sense, do, do you think that those years were in vain? Or do you think that in actuality, the, the Taliban of 2022 governing Afghanistan uh, is uh, more mature in some ways or um, perhaps more open or receptive to not Western values, but maybe some, some criteria for liberty and freedom than the Taliban uh, of 2001, pre or post 9-11. But do, do you sense that, that, there's, that there's any distinction from this, this Taliban from the earlier iteration of the Taliban? I'm not sanguine that there is a marked difference in the proclivities in this Taliban versus the Taliban that we ejected in the fall and spring of 2001 and 2002. As an example, this has caused me great vexation. The current Minister of the Interior in Afghanistan is Sarajuddin Haqqani. Sarajuddin Haqqani is the head of the Haqqani family, the Haqqani clan, the Haqqani network, which is a subset of the Taliban. The Haqqani was the most lethal, grisly, effective and regenerative terrorist organization operating against our forces and Afghan forces for the whole war. I mean, pick a grisly spectacle, a bombing of a hospital, an attack on a school, bombing of a bank in Nangarhar. This was most likely attributed to the Haqqani network before 2015, when the Islamic State Khorasan, the, the franchise in Afghanistan came to the fore, and they were trying to be with the Haqqanis for how, how horrid and egregious their atrocities would be. But this, the, the fact that this guy is the Minister of the Interior in charge of all internal security, and given the blood on the Haqqani Network's hands, I find that to be un, unfathom, unfathomable, although here it is. In 2022? 2022. <laughs> That's an emphatic and, and clear answer, and I'm glad that you can share that with, with the public, um, because perhaps there remain a little bit of, of hopefulness um, that um, there was some change in, in sort of a modus operandi, but it, it seems unlikely from what you're saying. I would add one thing. I would say, generally speaking, I don't think the Taliban leadership that was benefiting from sanctuary in Pakistan for the duration of the war and, and the Taliban uh, generally, I don't think they changed their, 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 their approach to the world their approach to Sharia in Afghanistan. I do think it's possible that because we spent 20 years paying, fighting, dying, bleeding in Afghanistan, that the Taliban leadership have a more realistic perspective on what the U.S. might do if another 9-11-like attack emanates from Afghanistan. Right, so, so maybe um, their appreciation of, of those boundaries uh, does exist, uh, whereas it it did not uh, pre 9/11 or in the immediate aftermath of 9/11. Um, now there is some clarity of, uh, and and therefore maybe because of awareness of those boundaries, there is a different sense of aspiration. Uh, what they are seeking to achieve with this current Taliban state, um, but I hear you no difference in in likely the violent proclivities um, or anti-human right. Uh, anti-human rights um, manifestations. Um, now we're we're in a, a period of of this Biden administration where the the public um, did not you know approve of the, its conduct in Afghanistan. It, it that really was a, a significant uh, event in in collapsing or deteriorating um, some. Um, popularity that the, the president had, um, at least in terms of at that point in his presidency, recovery from the pandemic. And of course, we're in this newest stage of, of COVID with Omicron now. Um, 
and we're also at at this juncture where there is a lot of reporting about Russia's um, particular aggression around Ukraine and the prospect of an invasion of Ukraine. Um, and we're recording this now um, in uh, mid late January. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen by the time this airs, but it does seem um, like a, a rather fluid situation, and, and there does seem to be a march to war um, in the media narrative around this. Uh, what is your sense of the accuracy of that march to war and, and whether uh, Putin, in fact, might invade Ukraine? And, and if that were to arise, what, what do you think, you know, knowing that the, the president had a year of, of foreign policy flaps to kind of develop a different reputation um, around the world in the way that he handles this uh, Russia-Ukraine escalation? Well, certainly the, uh, the debacle, the retreat, the abandonment in Afghanistan and uh, what that entailed for the cred credibility of, of the U.S. as a country and its leadership and its commitments is, is, is not something that was going to make our adversaries um, think we were tough, think we, we, we were someone to contend with. So I think certainly in, in Mr. Putin's eyes, uh, whatever estimation he had of Biden from before when Biden was vice president, his estimation is probably lowered. It's probably some of that knowledge is, is a factor in his calculus into what he's doing right now. I do want to back up just a minute, though. I, I don't, I would have to say for the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the polls in the U.S. indicated that a lot of Americans really wanted us to be out of Afghanistan. So that, that's something that's true. Yeah, ironic as that is, because President Biden was carrying out the will of the American people. And in fact, that began his slide in unpopularity. And, and maybe it's unrelated and just a coincidence. But it was, like you said, a debacle or the appearance of incompetence and then the further incompetence of the unmasking guidance uh, earlier in the spring, which led to new spikes in cases and a feeling that America was just never going to beat COVID. And we have to, to live with it, live with hospital shortages and a high infection rate and a life expectancy that has declined, uh, not just over the course of the Trump administration, but now the Biden administration. But, but this is, this is a, a real predicament. Uh, for Biden with respect to Ukraine, because uh, Ukraine had represented, uh, I wouldn't say quite uh, something like uh, Hong Kong or Taiwan in terms of, uh, um, you know, sort of hands off and we're going to we're going to become involved in that arena if, uh, for example, China uh, were to intervene in, 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 in an even more aggressive way uh, in independent, theoretically independent states in the southeast. Um, but but in a sense, Ukraine has represented that line in the sand. And so what do you do now if you're President Biden? It, it, I, I suppose the question is, what do you do in this negotiation? But let's assume that Putin actually uh, seeks to overthrow the independent um, the prime minister there and, and really take, take over the country. Um, if, if you're becoming aware of that movement on the ground, and uh, Russian troops are being deployed, and, and there is the prospect of real, a real uh, military theater. Uh, you know, what do you do if you're President Biden? It is quite a predicament. It's a conundrum be because it goes back to the, what we talked about, the will of the American public wanted us to be out of Afghanistan, but acting in foreign security policy, bringing a country to the brink of war, that is related to will, and will derives from the value of what you're trying to do. So what, what does Putin want vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and what does the U.S. want vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and what do our European allies and NATO want vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? I, I'm not going to resurrect the Munich analogy. I don't think uh, uh, strategy by nostalgia or analogy is the way to go, but remember that phrase that was common in the interwar period, Kiever Moria Podanzig? the Polish corridor, and it was not defendable geographically. It was beyond the reach of the British and the French, and it was untenable. And um, so I'm not going to be an apologist for Mr. Putin, but if you look at the map and you explore the history of Russia, invaded massively twice 
in two centuries, Napoleon in the 19th century, the Germans in the 20th century, Ukraine's 1,200 miles of border, historically is part of the Russian space. So I would say that whatever Mr. Putin's thinking, and nobody can really pin him down, they're not sure if he's, um, if he's uh, machinating to achieve some concessions from Biden, or whether he really wants to go. No, all the, the Russian uh, scholars and experts that have been writing in foreign affairs and are on TV, no one's really committing to what Mr. Putin wants, but I can tell you this, uh, Mr. Putin in Russia, the polity, uh, that population probably ascribes more will to what they're gonna do in, in Eastern Ukraine than the United States does. So our, 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 it's not an existential problem for us. The, the Russians see it, see it as existential or the way that Putin is framing it and propagating it makes it appear to be existential. But yet we still can't do nothing. And so Mr. Biden, uh, the president, people are, seem to think he looks weak uh, because of the pull out of Afghanistan and some other things. So he, he can't look weak but that doesn't mean I want the U.S. to go to war over Eastern, Eastern Ukraine. So I think the Ukrainians in, in, uh, should have a high value on protecting their sovereign integrity. So I think an indirect approach, what they're trying to do is to arm, equip, and help the Ukrainians, if the Russians come in, to make it costly. I mean, I don't think putting three U.S. divisions in Eastern Ukraine is the solution, but you know, raising the costs for Mr. Putin to make um, them get closer to the value of what he's trying to do in Eastern Ukraine might give him pause to recalibrate his calculus. But there has to be some deterrent and it has to be credible. And I don't know if the deterrent right now is credible enough, although there are some Ukrainians who would fight to the death to defend their land against a Russian invasion. I mean, from, from the non-military perspective in terms of Ukraine as an American interest, um, I mean, I think we all have to be honest about the fact that uh, if you know we are as battered as we are on the home front now with with COVID, um, and we are fatigued, um, the, the American voter or the American citizen, the the, the American civilian, uh, is probably you know honest about the fact that uh, this is not in the national interest. I mean, this is. The security of Ukraine is not in the national interest in an immediate sense. Um, in a longer term sense, yes. But I, I just wonder how you assess the the fact that the American nation is is so fatigued right now. The the individual American is fatigued, and 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 it's almost a little bit this the same dynamic in in Russia. I mean, we know that the quality in life of Russia has not really gotten better under Putin. The, the interest in Ukraine is a matter of, um, you know, nationalism, pride, ego, um, the restoration of, of the Soviet Union. If you look at it from the American perspective, what, what are the motivating factors that, that, that ought to lead us to intervene? Um, if, if there are any good ones, um, you know, but more specifically, besides just the idea that we need to deter or contain Russian uh, aggression? Well, th there are factors, but they're not existential or even grave for the political and territorial integrity of the United States. But they're, yeah. you know, the kind of international system we like to see continue is based on the rule of law. It's based on some uh, enforcement of the, uh, the, the clauses in the United Nations Charter. I mean, we're a, a key founder of the United Nations. You know, the United Nations has gotten a lot of, uh, been beaten by um, pundits and scholars and whomever over the last several years, but still has the clause that, you know, aggression against another state is proscribed. So are we gonna do anything? Um, I think that we, uh, the, the other challenge with this country is what we said is the country's in, in disarray, there's disunity. So if, if you're going to fight a war, you have to know what kind of war you're going to fight. You have to know how much you're going to pay for it. And you have to mobilize your population to go after it. But if you have a war that has a high value political object like World War II, it's easier to mobilize. And there's another, and, and what I teach at, at Wesleyan, Clausewitz, Sansa, Mao Zedong, the key thing about Clausewitz is that, you know, capacity and will can bring about victory or defeat. So you have to hit the capacity and the will, and sometimes you hit both. 
But if you are if you are being for a very limited political object based on alliance integrity in a, in a world you'd like to see versus an existential threat, which Putin would see NATO going to Ukraine, uh, abutting Russia's border, that would be perceived as an existential problem. So how do you keep right. the, the people, the government and the armed forces mobilized to fight a fight that's of limited value? You can't take a lot of losses. And since World War II, the US has not undertaken uh, wars for limited political objects with enough, enough analysis, enough strategic wisdom, and enough will to persist and be successful. We've done very poorly since World War II in all the wars we fought where the value of what we're trying to do was very limited vis-a-vis -vis the value of what our enemies were trying to do. Example, the Vietnam War. And, and in that sense, our, our recent forays into military conflict, um, with the exception of, of the attack on Al-Qaeda uh, and the ongoing pursuit of, of uh, domestic and international terrorists, it's not really motivated by an existential threat. It's motivated more by, at least in the context of what we're discussing now, Ukraine, and a spiritual side, I mean, a sort of a, a, an idea that we can, um, from the perspective of people perhaps in the military who would who would recommend action to President Biden or military leaders who would be in favor of this, it would be kind of to change the subject, the old wag the dog. I mean, in, in, in truth, um, the, the kind of, it is not um, that there is a, a uh, specific goal as much as what would motivate our intervention is more of a kind of intervening for, I don't want to say the sake of intervening, but intervening to feel better about ourselves for, for, for a kind of spiritual or morale improvement. Um, and, and I'm just wondering how much, how persuasive are those people going to be who, who are really, whether they're being direct about it or not, that that's what they're arguing for. They're arguing for action to, you know, to, to, improve the, the spiritual uh, or moral um, confidence of this country? The hope is not a method. So we, we, don't go to, we don't want to go to war on aspiration. So but the thing is, if he acts too much, he's going to get pilloried by certain segments of our population. If he does not enough, then other segments of the population will, will pillory the president because he's, he's, a, you know, he's, a, he's an easy target. But I, but I mean, if we're talking about the Joint Chiefs, if we're talking about the military leaders who would be executing a strategy uh, to support uh, Europe or, or um, NATO or, or, you know, a U.S. operation to protect Ukraine, basically to save Ukraine. Do you think the people who are advocating that, if that is being advocated by anyone, are, are people primarily seeing this um, not through the kind of tactical lens, but who are seeing it through the spiritual lens? I mean, who are, who are seeing it th through more of an emotive kind of, we need to do this, you know, the, the, the Cold War wasn't really won, even though we thought we won the Cold War. And, you know, it doesn't matter what the tactical or existential questions are, this will make us feel better. And we, we have this military to use for this purpose. Why, you know, I'm wondering if, if that- I would hope. I would hope that none of the service chiefs are advocating that. I, I know some of them. I, I, I know uh, you know the chairman. I, I served with him before, and he, he, he's a smart guy, he's a capable guy. I'm, I'm pretty confident that he's not going to recommend deploying U.S. forces to eastern Ukraine to prevent some sort of Russian incursion. But they are probably oh, yeah. re recommending a series of coercive and non-coercive measures short of war that might be brought into play that would maybe think yeah. cause Mr. Putin to revisit his, mm -hmm. his rationality. So right now he's, he's more wily and guileful than anybody we have doing national security, including the POTUS, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, and maybe all the service chiefs, because you know, he doesn't have a lot of, a lot of uh, backlash in the press because he, <laughs> he controls the press. He doesn't have any political opponents because yeah. he puts them in jail. So he's a unitary actor, but he has to act in a way that's going to continue to make the Russian people think that he's the autocrat they want. Right. And, and I didn't mean to suggest that, uh, that our chairman or that the leading military chieftains would operate from that perspective. But I, but I do think that uh, there, there is 
increasingly the possibility of sort of emotional pretext rather than an evidence-based pretext. Colonel Cassidy, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Thank you, Alexander. Appreciate it. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.